This is what I do about two minutes before I go on the air every day. I run upstairs with my final cup of coffee and my uh, laptop and whatever scribbled notes I have and usually about 45 different articles that I've printed up from the Montana Watchdog, maybe the Helena IR, uh, maybe the Sydney Herald, whatever our radio affiliates are sending us and, uh, and of course whatever else you can find online from the Helena hand baskets or the second grade bike rack or the left in the west or, uh, or even cowgirl or uh, of course Electric City weblog up in Great Falls and so and then and then once I really start to flail and struggle because I've got too much information in my head, luckily uh, Elena from Phillipsburg who is here is, is there to bail me out and call in and, 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 and talk on the radio. So that's a good thing about talk radio is that whenever you, you kind of start to get off a of track or, or you just you need to take a little break, boom, you go to the phone call and you get to hear what people have to say. So it's a great job. So I thought we might do a little bit of that later today, especially since we're moving a little faster, is that, is that I can wrap up my remarks and then I thought since I'm going to try to talk about at least my opinion on, on the political impact of blogs here in the state of Montana, I thought I know we've got bloggers in the room and we've got extra microphones here. If we've got a little bit of time, I'd really love to, to start off the day finding out some of the bloggers that are here in the room because I know for me that was the most exciting thing about this event was the chance to really, you know, if you hadn't met Phil Drake yet, now you can go actually meet Phil Drake and Michael Noyes and, and, and some of the other bloggers that are out there. So, so if some of you bloggers are in the room and I know some of you try to stay anonymous, so if you want to stay anonymous you can stay in your chair, but if you want to come up and say your name and maybe give a, a minute or two on what you think the political influence of the blogs are in Montana, then I think that'd be great as long as, long as you guys aren't opposed to it out there. Or we could talk about kind of anything and everything else as we always do uh, as well. I uh, had a great drive over from Missoula yesterday or this morning. Uh, went up there for the, the holiday weekend, Earth Day. No, I'm just kidding. It's uh, the, the Easter weekend. but. Uh, but certainly you wonder as you read some of the front pages of the newspapers that, uh, that it's, it's not the Earth Day holiday weekend, that yes, it is actually Easter, and, and yes, it was Good Friday, but nonetheless, it was good being in Missoula. Oddly enough, they were using just as much energy as I was. Uh, the lights were on in the University Center. People were driving SUVs, and uh, even with the Earth Day bumper stickers, amazing how that works. But I guess I want to take a, a step back. I'm fairly new. I don't profess to be any sort of expert on anything, frankly, but let alone on blogging, especially as somebody who's relatively new to the whole blogging environment, especially when you look at like uh, the blogs like Electric City Weblog, that Greg Smith, and now uh, the elected uh, Public Service Commissioner Travis Cavula that they've been working on out of Great Falls, and you look at Left in the West, in fact, and Matt Singer, who was one of the leaders of that, uh, in fact, Matt and I sparred over politics back at the University of Montana when I was in student government. He was the uh, political action director uh, at, for the Associated Students of the University of Montana. I've had Matt on the talk show. And, and so it's really great to incorporate the bloggers in the, t in the talk show. But I guess in looking at this, I want to kind of take a step back now that I'm, now that I'm getting old. And I want to look back 10 years ago because I see all these kids that are now blogging. I, I know I say that kids. Some people still think I'm a kid, but I'm actually 31 now. But, but 10 years ago, I was just a 21-year-old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tw uh, like my wife's now going to have her third kid, and they're like, this isn't your first? And they're looking at her. But, uh, but uh, 10 years ago, I was just a 21-year-old staffer on Capitol Hill. I went out to Howard University in Washington, D.C. for college. And and somebody put the idea in, hey, why don't you go do an internship for, for Senator Conrad Burns while you're out there? And I said, yeah, I might as well. It'd be a great opportunity. You know, Tim Russert worked on Capitol Hill, then he went into journalism, and Chris Matthews worked on Capitol Hill, and then he went into journalism, and, and so, hey, it'd be a great experience. And, and so I think about 10 years ago, and I started off just as a press intern, even earlier than that, and then they called me back a year later to intern again, and then I became a legislative staffer. And I think back on how we got information, and I wasn't a press secretary, so obviously they could give you a more in-depth report, but just in general, how we got our information. Obviously, you had field representatives out there gathering information, meeting with constituents, meeting with local leaders, whether it's the mayor or the, the county commissioners or the public service commissioners. Uh, but in all of these offices, as I'd imagine uh, you know, John Tester and Max Baucus and Denny Reber's offices still do today, they'd be out there and they'd take the local newspaper or the, and, and they'd scan a copy of that article, they'd cut it out, and then, and then they'd scan and, and send in and fax in all these clips from, from the local headlines. And then eventually, maybe late morning, this whole stack of news clippings from across the state would show up. And, 
and, and there'd be Stan Ullman out there smoking one of his cartons of cigarettes that day out front uh, on the corner of uh, Constitution Avenue as he's reading through this big batch of, of clips for any of you know, who, who know the crusty old guy Stan Ullman. And, and, and then of course we got phone calls, but email was really even just getting started. And of course there was, there's still trouble with spam today, but spam was a huge problem back then. I mean, we were getting in thousands of emails and half of them, and even if it was somebody from Montana, how would you know? Because they didn't always say, uh, they didn't, didn't always put their name. They didn't say, hey, this is Elena in Phillipsburg, and here's my address, and here's my phone number. So how do you know that these are Montanans contacting you or not? And, uh, but, but nonetheless, before the election in 2000, we were answering email to email traffic from the office within days so it, versus Back then, it was everything was through letter traffic. You'd get you'd get a phone call, you'd get a letter, you'd get an email, and then it'd go sit on somebody's desk here, and then it'd sit on somebody's desk here, and then it'd go here, and then it'd go there. Or sometimes, if it was flagged and they said, "Hey, senator needs to see this," obviously they they'd see that right away. But there was this this kind of a, almost like a bureaucratic process, and so we totally turned that around on its head and ended up getting an award from the Congressional Management Foundation at the time about 10 years ago for turning that around and really aggressively pushing you know, email to email communication and, and becoming more of an online office. But really it wasn't until, oddly enough, so we think back 10 years ago and that's how we were communicating, that's how we were getting information and, and communicating well with folks. There wasn't obviously a lot of bloggers or anything like that. Uh, and just much like 10 years ago when there weren't a lot of bloggers and, um, you know, and the governor wasn't wearing bolo ties back then, uh, uh, you know, then 9-11 happened. And aside from all the political implications of 9-11, I kind of think that 9-11 also pushed us into an era, it pushed the government into more, uh, into an era of kind of online governance. Because for those of us who were on Capitol Hill when 9-11 happened, uh, I was there in, in the office, stayed till the last moments, but obviously after, after the towers came down and the Pentagon's hit, we're thinking another plane is coming for the United States Capitol. Uh, and so at that point, a lot of the people had already, they'd already left, they'd already evacuated the Capitol, uh, the Senate office buildings and the House office buildings. Few of us had stayed behind, but then at that point, how do you govern? You, we've still got, our, our elected officials still need to be making decisions, but even though essentially their offices have been evacuated and when are you going to return? And then a month later, what, about a month later, I think it was in October, you had the anthrax attacks, which did the same thing. Now, boom, we've been, we've been pushed out of our offices again, but yet we need to still communicate with folks back here in Montana and, and these elected officials still need to be able to communicate with each other and then you'd be able to get, so we needed this backup communications channel. So, so instead of now walking into your office where you have this big, you know, computer that's, that's stuck to your desk, we started transitioning to laptops. And, and back then there was only a few staffers that had Blackberries and, and, and now I think, uh, you know, even I can afford a Blackberry, barely, but, uh, but even I can have access to one and there's, and there's all these smartphones and everything like that. And, and, and you compare it to today that now, I'll guarantee each one of those offices are monitoring Facebook and Twitter and, and, uh, and, and YouTube. Uh, and, and I think about back then about how really you had the AP that had a reporter focusing on Montana that was in Washington, D.C. Uh, the newspapers, the, the Lee newspapers had a reporter in Washington, D.C. focusing on, uh, on our elected officials in Washington, D.C. The TV stations, uh, in large part, they had a student, say from Northwestern University, who was there covering Montana politicians in Washington, D.C. But now as a, as a result of uh, basically decline in, in the, the news business, there's nobody in Washington, D.C watching out for Montana. There's no Montana watchdog sitting in, in, in Washington, D.C. right now to really track what these guys are doing. And so I think that's made bloggers even more critical right now uh, because uh, I'll get into that a little bit more, a little bit later, but, but the only information we're getting about our, about our Montana congressional delegation, unless they're back here and you, you get a phone interview or you get them in person, the information that we're getting is virtually all press release information that comes out of there until you start to see reports in Roll Call or The Hill or maybe the National Journal or Politico or The Wall Street Journal and they dig into some of these articles. And so it, it's the bloggers that are reaching out and finding those little golden nuggets that are hidden uh, that, that otherwise we're not hearing about back here in Montana. 
And so I look at what we can do today after the November elections, and, and obviously the, um, the, the right had a, had a huge victories after the November election. Uh, and, and so I, I just think about the fact that what would happen before? Here's President Barack Obama giving a big press conference, first press conference after the November elections. And before, what would you have to do? Well, you'd have to, maybe your local cable channel, they'd, they'd be broadcasting his speech. Well, I'm in the middle of our talk show, and I say, hey folks, you can go to our website, you can click on my blog, and you can watch the President's press conference live from our blog. And we, we were live streaming the President's press conference. So if you're sitting at your computer and at your work, and all of a sudden you hear that on your radio, or you see that come across your screen, click, make it a full screen, you've now got the President live on, on, your, on your computer. The congressional delegation before, rather than just sending press releases out to this kind of handful of reporters or uh, folks back here in the Montana media, now they're uploading videos to YouTube that folks in the blogging community know we just, well, right click, grab that, embed, embed that HTML code, copy and paste that onto your blog, and now you've got that video on your website. You can grab their pictures, you can grab their video, but it's all through just grabbing that, the embed code even for that live stream, and now you, on your blog in Great Falls, or your blog in Missoula, have the ability to become that source of information, the, the live stream even, from, uh, from President uh, Barack Obama. Then I, I look back and I, I, you see my computer sitting here, and, and I use TweetDeck, and I don't use TweetDeck just because that's the best uh, source of software that's out there. You guys probably have a better option. I just use it because it was something I saw, somebody was using it. So I grabbed that one, so that's what I've been using for the past few months. So, but with TweetDeck, here I can see uh, when I'm in the middle of my talk show, I can send a message to Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, uh, missing one, Facebook, my, oh, Twitter, of course. <laughs> all in one shot. You can send a message out there. And then I'm also monitoring all this traffic that's coming in. And so, uh, like for example, the other day, the pay plan is being debated uh, in the state legislature. And, um, but I'm in the middle of the talk show, so obviously I'm not listening to the legislative session. And, and so I'm in the middle of the show and we're talking to folks and, and I'm saying a few things. And as I'm talking, there's these little, you know, this little you know, tweet sound is, is made on my computer and up pops a message. And you're starting to see messages from Marne Banks, with, which is, of course, the Montana CBS reporter here in, in Helena. You're seeing uh, Chuck Johnson. You're seeing Mike Dennison. You're seeing the Montana Watchdog. Uh, you're seeing the bloggers that are out there, all giving various updates on what is happening right then and right there in the legislative session. So, so I can then take that information and then immediately give it out over the airwaves. Obviously, I want to know that whoever says they're Chuck Johnson on Twitter or whoever says they're Montana Watchdog, that that's actually their account because, you know, you don't want to make sure you're not just covered. Because there's a Max Baucus Twitter page that obviously is not Max Baucus's uh, <laughs> Twitter, Twitter page that's feeding out uh, various, uh, various stories. But when it comes to the question of the, uh, of the political impact, this was something, and anybody who's read my blog or, or listened to me on the talk show, I, I often go in tangents, so it's, it's really hard for me to do prepared remarks. So I, but I was really trying to be, have more prepared remarks for something like this, but, but to be honest with you, I, I don't really know what the political impact is of blogs in Montana right now. I mean, I think, I think a few years ago, a lot of people kind of wrote off the blogs and they said, oh, that's just some guy sitting in his basement in his underwear, uh, you know, with, pardon my French here, but diarrhea of the mouth. These guys are just ranting and raving, and sometimes they have facts and sometimes they don't. But I think it's, I think it's, it's really evolved here in Montana to where the, the question that we get to, to go along, well, what is the political influence of the blogs here in Montana? What, what impact do they really have? I mean, I mean, is that farmer out in, in eastern Montana, is he really, is he, is he getting, you know, is he getting home from, you know, is, is the rancher getting home from checking on calves or, or jumping off the tractor and they saying, oh, I got to go check in on Twitter today. You know, probably not. Now, it's probably getting to that. Now, obviously, they might go to Twitter and check the northern ag tweets to find out what the prices are and, and, and see what the latest is there, see what the futures are looking like. But they're probably not spending all day on Twitter. And so, and so you'll, you'll hear even folks in the sales community and those of you who, who are maybe blogging for business, if you're, if you're in the newspaper industry or TV or anything like that, I'm sure your salespeople probably tell you, okay, look, 
Yeah, but why are we going to waste our time on that? Why are you going to waste your time on, on some blog, on, on some website, when, when frankly you can sell a, a, ra a newspaper ad or a TV ad or a radio ad for ten times the amount? Why? Why are we going to spend our time on that? Why are, why are we going to focus on that? And, and I think the answer is part of at least my thoughts on, on what the political impact of, of the blogs are. And I think the, I think the, the right is, is slowly coming on more and more, but so far the left has kind of dominated the blogs here in Montana. But, but they, although there are some strong conservative blogs that are out there, but, but I, I think that the blogs themselves, uh, yeah, they're not reaching the masses. They're, there's probably not 100,000 people going and monitoring all the various blogs across Montana on a given day's basis. But, but where the blogs are critical is that the blogs are influencing the, inf the influencers in the sense that, and I think we saw this in the legislative session, that if there was something that would just take hold, one of the most brilliant things that was done, I think, this past legislative session, I think it was by the left, um, it was where I, at least I first saw it from some of the folks on the left from, from via Twitter and stuff, was they created one of these little hashtags. How, how familiar are, if you're very familiar with Twitter, raise your hand, I guess, in the room here. Okay, so about three, maybe, no familiarity with Twitter at all. Would you raise your hand? Some, or some familiarity? Okay, some. Well, so Twitter, as I'm sitting there, you know, you're getting these messages in all day. Okay, governor's speaking in Missoula to Montpurg. Here's a link. Senator John Tester being followed by Washington Post reporter in Lewistown. Here's a link. And so these messages are coming in from all these people that you follow. So I see, oh, okay, second grade bike rack just said this. Oh, uh, Montana Cowgirl said this. And so then you click that link. And, and so you're constantly getting this track of, traffic of information. Well, they created this thing, this hashtag, and it's a pound sign, and then it says MT Ledge, M-T-L-E-G. So then whenever you put that hashtag on your message, MT Ledge, anybody who who clicks that hashtag is now getting every message that is sent that says Montana Ledge on it. And so they created that. But, but I think what, what that has the tendency to do is that if you're sitting here watching all of these hashtags come across and you're seeing all these stories about Montana, Montana Ledge is that I think, I think we can get too caught up in what's being said in the Twitterverse, which shows how influential that can be. Uh, that, that then that becomes the storyline that is in maybe the newspapers or maybe in, in, in the, on, on the TV stations that night or maybe uh, even out in radio because that's just right there in front of you that, that, that now the Twitterverse has, has overtaken actual Main Street Montana and what the concerns of, of everyday folks might be. And I say that because to one, but reinforce the fact that the folks who are out there and are getting involved online are influential. You know, you don't need to be getting 60,000 hits a month on your website to be influencing 60,000 people across the state of Montana. That yes, right now, the, the true influence is still in, in, in the fact that, that if you've got a statewide newspaper uh, chain that can have one article written by one person in, in the city of Helena that will go out to everybody practically in every city across the state, that, that, that a radio talk show, for example, that I've been blessed to be a part of, that every day can talk to 50,000 plus people across the state of Montana. Uh, that TV, for example, Montana CBS has a huge presence. They all work together. They're all linked in statewide. So, so one story done from one city can air on every single station statewide. And, and so that's the present. So right now, yeah, the blogs aren't reaching the people that maybe the newspapers are reaching, that the TVs are reading, that, that the radio is reaching. But the simple fact is, and then you all have seen it, is that when, when your words are posted and you make a compelling argument or you have a link to interesting piece of information, the folks in TV and in radio and in the newspaper are going to notice that. But the other thing that we notice too is that we're seeing a decline in, in, in traditional media right now. I mentioned nobody's even, there, there is no Montana watchdog in Washington, D.C. They're going to be hitting you up later, Carl, to start, start one of those probably now. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there is no watchdog in Washington, D.C. And, and, you know, I, I know we could have a big debate about bias in the media. You know, I think really the, the bias, and, it, and it's from anybody, is, is just a bias of ideas, a lack of ideas. And that yeah, I think a lot of journalists, they, 
they, they, they go to the same schools, they, they come from the same demographic background, and so, so they approach things from the same standpoint. And so when you bring more voices to the table, like what Phil Drake talked about, then, yeah, that, that reporter might not normally write that story, but maybe they never heard that viewpoint before. Maybe they never, maybe they never read what Dave Skinner told them in, in the Flathead Beacon, for example, about the, oil, the, the, the natural gas potential in and around the Flathead. They, they never heard that before, so why would they think to even cover that angle? And so, so I guess what I'm saying is, is, that, is that before we're quick to, to jump on the media for being, and, and I'll be the first to jump on, on, on folks in the media as well, but before we're quick to jump on them for saying that they're biased because they didn't cover this story or that story, I guess I'd just ask us, well, when did you tell them that side of the story? When did you give them a chance to actually hear that angle? Um, and, and too often that, that doesn't happen. Some, some quick examples of, of recent blog posts that I think you can definitely show, and, and this will be something I'll be interested in hearing from folks in the audience, maybe you have some examples of, and I was trying to pose the question to some different folks that were out there, uh, you know, some different folks in politics about, hey, what, what are some examples you can highlight where blogs really made a political impact and really kind of shifted the agenda? Uh, I thought there was one this week, and, and this was a story. I mentioned Senator John Tester was in Lewistown earlier this week, and a Washington Post reporter, Phil Rucker, was you know he's doing one of these profile pieces. I'm assuming because uh, where he's going to follow uh, John Tester around, and he's going to follow Denny Reberg around, and, and they're going to do this big profile piece that'll end up in the Washington Post. And uh, this is the same week, and I know we've got a, a focus on money and politics coming up later uh, in the session that'll be interesting as well, but in this same week, a report came out in The Hill, a Capitol Hill newspaper, talking about how, you know, last year the U.S. Senate passed this massive financial uh, overhaul, this, this financial reform bill, right? You guys remember that being thrown around, and they were, they were sticking it to the big banks and Wall Street, right? And, and, of, and I'm not trying to just pick on Senator Tester, but I'm... So I'm not going to try to get too political here, but I just want to use this as a case in point to point out the influence of blogs. So now, but somebody said I could pick on him. So now he supported that effort last year, but now this year, in a reversal, he's now got a bill that would that that that, that the credit unions and the big banks want to see passed. He's trying to do away with something that was passed as part of this financial overhaul bill, something that he supported last year. So as The Hill reported, now he's in, the, in 17 days following his, rever his, his reversal in position, he's now banking uh, from the credit card industry, collecting in almost $100,000. If you just count donations alone in 17 days following, I mean, over $60,000 in donations uh, from, from, uh, from employees of just one firm, for example, top executives of, of, of the big banks now donating to his campaign. I talked with a guy from a credit union in, in Missoula yesterday, and he was saying, yeah, the credit unions are really thanking him for what he's doing on this. And I said, well, I mean, if I was the credit unions, I mean, you wouldn't have this problem today if it wasn't for the bill last year. Uh, so it's just interesting to me that, that okay, that, uh, well, we passed the bill. We created the problem in the eyes. Now, some folks might say it's a problem. Some folks might say it's not a problem. But either way, if you're a credit union order and you're saying we are hurting, we got sick as a result of this bill, and now you're saying we need a cure and Senator John Tester has the cure, well, the same people that got you sick are the same people that are now saying they're going to give you the cure. And I just find it odd. I know it's, it's, it sounds conspiratorial. And, and, and it sounds like the James Bond movie, but, 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 but it certainly seems, seems like it to me that, okay, you were for it then, and, and, and you caused this problem for these credit unions. Maybe it's a problem you folks like, but you caused this problem for credit unions and, and these banks, uh, and you supported that. Well, now you're saying, oh, okay, I'll do away with it. And, and now, by the way, while you're doing that, the campaign donations are, are pouring in and you're raking in the cash and, and now you're bragging about how you raised over a million dollars. And you can, find, you can find a lot of examples like that. And I'm not the type of person that says that, that just because somebody contributes to your campaign that that is implicitly corrupt or implicitly unethical. Uh, but I think where it does start to come in is when people start to reverse their positions. But so, so that was the big story, and, it, and it's a huge story. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars in ads that are on, on the airwaves right now about that very issue where you've got the big banks and the, and the smaller credit unions battling against uh, the retailers, 
who don't want these swipe fees, and then the, the big banks and the credit unions are saying, we need these swipe fees. And so they're battling over, so there's lots of money coming around, and it's kind of the media bailout of the spring, actually, sounds like it. Uh, but the thing is, is that when that article came out in the Hill, I thought, wow, this is a huge story. Uh, but I didn't see a mention. I mean, somebody tell me, I know I, I've, been, I've been traveling to Missoula, I didn't see it mentioned on TV, I didn't see it mentioned in the major statewide newspapers, without naming any names. I know I mentioned it on, on the talk show. I know Treasure State Politics mentioned it. So how was it then? Was I hearing from people in Lewistown who said, hey, by the way, uh, Senator Tester was in Lewistown uh, and he took some questions from some, or from, from some high school students and apparently they had asked him some questions about this uh, campaign contribution story from the credit card companies. And, and I thought, wow, yeah, we've got high school students asking the questions that the mainstream media is not asking. Uh, it was big enough to the Hill in Washington, D.C. It probably would have been big enough back in 2006 if it was on the other side of the aisle, but nary a mention in the mainstream newspapers and in, 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 in a lot of the mainstream media this week. Uh, but yet, high school students were able to do that. Now, you could find a, an issue on the right as well, uh, and point out, but, but I just raised that story to point out that high school students raised that question. Now, I don't know how they heard about that story and where they thought to ask the senator maybe that question. Maybe it was online. Maybe their parents were listening to the talk show, which is on their local radio station, and they heard something about it then, so they thought, hey, that might be a good, good question to ask. But, but that's the impact that this stuff can really have. And, 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 and I think it also presents a warning to the traditional media that, look, if you continue to ignore these stories that these bloggers are pointing out, that these high school kids are asking about, and, and that, if, that if, if we get so afraid uh, that, that we're going to step on somebody's toes in, in some member of Congress's office or somebody in, in this state agency's office, that, that we stop asking the tough questions of everybody that, that, yeah, you may not be seeing it now, and right now the blogs in Montana are really just influencing the influencers, but eventually those high school kids are going to be owning the auto parts store, and they're going to be running the farm, and they're going to be running a state agency, and soon they don't see you as the source of information anymore. And now that little blog that was just over there maybe getting a thousand absolute unique visitors a week, which is very good, by the way, in Montana terms, now, that is their primary source of information. And, and, and when, the, when they're reading more information about a major U.S. Senate race in Montana in 2012 from Politico.com in Washington, D.C., uh, from, from a blog in Great Falls or a blog in Helena, when they're getting more information that way, we have got a lot of choices, folks. So, so yes, the blogs are critical right now. It's critical that folks on all sides get more involved in the, in the blogging community because you're influencing the influencers. So that's, I mean, if that can be kind of a rally call to those of you who are blogging, whether on the left or the right, but, but I would say also that you are cultivating the next business, the next business model because, because the more and more the mainstream media just doesn't cover the stories that people really want to hear about and ask the questions that people really want asked, or they see this side being questioned and not this side. Uh, they're just going to start bypassing that traditional media and they want to go directly to sources where they get it. And of course, how we can improve on that and become better citizen journalists, I know we'll hear, hear more about later today. Obviously, of course, the, the big story prior to the legislative session during the, was, of course, the, the Montana Cowgirl blog as well. And I don't think I see Montana Cowgirl here, at least based on the latest rumors of whoever Montana Cowgirl is. And I know a lot of people, there's a, there's a debate about kind of anonymous bloggers and, and, you know, they think, look, if you're not willing to put your name on it, don't, don't say it. But, uh, you know, so that, that's a good discussion to have that we, that we could probably have uh, at some point today or, or, or later as well. But, but uh, I, for one, I'm interested in getting the information. Now, granted, I'm not going to trust something as much if it's from, from an anonymous source and if it doesn't really have facts, but, but certainly you're seeing the development of these kind of surrogate blogs that I would call them where, where you know, a political press secretary, the, the line was always followed, um, never, never pick a fight, and I didn't write this down, but don't pick a fight with somebody who buys ink by the, by the barrel and paper by the tongue. So these press secretaries, I mean, you're a press secretary in Washington, D.C., and you're like, 
man, I continue to get hosed by this reporter and they never get my point of view across. They don't even talk about this story. They don't talk about this. Why did they cover that story about me and they didn't cover that story about him or that story about her? And so these press secretaries are boiling mad. But if they pick a fight with a reporter, what's that reporter going to do? Oh, I'm not talking to you anymore. Oh, I'm writing him off. Oh, that guy, oh, he's, he's just mad. I mean, you know, some, I forget who said the quote that reporters can have a glass jaw, that they throw punches all day, they hit people all day long, and then the moment somebody throws a shot back at them, whether it's a blogger or, or a politician or somebody else, boom, they get hit by the, in the jaw and then they're down for the count because they're just used to throwing punches. They're not used to taking them back. Uh, so, so I think you're seeing also when you talk about political influence, you're seeing that the, you know, a lot more of these surrogate blogs, and I would certainly say that the Montana Cowgirl blog is a surrogate blog. I mean, the latest, the, the, I guess the most believed thought among the reporters in Helena and, and other folks is that, okay, it's likely at least two folks who work for the governor's office. There were some other rumors that were out there. There are lots, all sorts of rumors, and I'm not going to say that one of those are, is true or, or is not true, but, but it's, it's very clear that that blog is being used to say the things that maybe the party doesn't want to say themselves or that maybe the, the candidates themselves don't want to say, but that gives them a venue to throw it out there to say some of the things that they wouldn't feel comfortable saying that you wouldn't want to put your name next to. And I think, I think the right it has developed some of that and, 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 and I think certainly you're seeing a, a lot of impact now by Treasure State Politics, which, was, which is run by two very influ influential young conservatives. In fact, I talked with, uh, with Austin James. He showed up at our show in Missoula yesterday. He's a, with the college Republicans in Missoula. And you know, he said they got their whole blog up and running. He said they got a girl who's a college student who's a media arts major, so she said, yeah, I'll do the graphics for you. Little Mitch Staley, the, the other guy who is a young kid who's, who's, working on the, uh, who's working on the blog, he said, well, you can learn anything if you stay up all night and do it. I don't know about you, but I still can't learn a lot about HTML code and everything. So it's just incredible what's, what, what's happening out there. I guess in, to close with, and then maybe we can open it up if we still got time or we can move forward, either whatever you guys think. If, I'd love to hear who's out there and maybe some of your thoughts on the influence of blogs. Uh, with the time that we have remaining, but you know, one thing when you, it's easy to get really caught up when when we're in the blogosphere and we're all arguing back and forth because everybody's is is admirably passionate about the given issues that we end up discussing, uh, and so it's easy to get you know ticked off at this guy or ticked off at that guy, but but I was encouraged when I first started hosting the talk show. Uh, and I think this is where the good bloggers really stand out. You know, there's, there's the surrogates that are out there that they're just there to put out party talking points and they're not going to answer. If you have a good thoughtful question, they're not going to answer it. They're just going to shift topics and, and, and they'll post a really good piece of information about people that they're opposed to, but they won't post the really good information about somebody that they support. And I think if you really want to be a blogger, you're not going to be afraid to have it all out on the table and, and, and have an open, honest debate of, uh, about all the topics and all the issues that are out there. And, and so I was really encouraged after I first started hosting Voices of Montana, uh, which is the state's only statewide radio talk show. Uh, I had Greg Smith from the Electric City Weblog, and then I had Jay Stevens from Left in the West. And uh, and I was thinking, oh man, this is, I'm going to have to kind of, you know, I'm going to be holding two horses here as they're going to be fighting back and forth. And you know what? It was probably the smoothest, uh, most polite hour I think I've ever heard on talk radio. And these guys after the show were talking on the phone and they said, and, and Jay said, oh, hey, Greg, I love what you're doing with your blog. And Greg said, yeah, you guys do a great job. And, and they were just happy to talk to each other because they've been writing back and forth through these various blogs. But they were finally happy to, to just talk face to face. And I think, I think there has to be a mutual respect among all parties that, hey, you know what, I may not agree with you, I may not agree with what you're writing, I may not with, agree with what you're writing, but if we're all committed to getting more information out there, bringing more information to light, more information to the table, uh, you know, I, I think that's what it's really got to be. And, and that's the way to make not just an impact in Montana politics, but also to make a positive impact in Montana politics. And I probably went way too long, but I, I think what, we got about 10 minutes till our break, nine minutes. As, uh, um, we've got a mic here. I don't know, uh, Mike, do you want to run the mic? There we go. Uh, any bloggers or other folks who want to just say your name and maybe give a quick spiel on why, you know, why, what you think uh, the impact of uh, Montana blogs are? It looks like we got Jay up here in the front. Uh, I'm not a blogger, but I'd just be curious, where do you think you have a greater impact? On Voice Montana or on the bloggers? Is it, you know, is it a 
copacetic relationship, or what do you think? And what's the Voice of Montana started first, and then you began to develop? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, obviously, the talk show, I mean, hands down, has way more impact. I mean, you're talking to 50,000 people at least every given day, Monday through Friday, uh, especially in eastern Montana. I mean, everybody listens to the radio. You drive in any... You drive into the little oil shop or all the, farm, the Farmer's Oil uh, Incorporated uh, shop and everybody's in there listening while they're working and talking and having a cup of coffee. So hands down. But that being said, look, our company and every other company out there knows that you have got to cultivate an online business model or, you know, if you don't do that, I mean, you're, you're risking just being out of business, frankly. That being said, though, I think now you have, and this was something I'm glad you mentioned it, now we have the ability to not only be a talk show host, you, we've got the ability to also be a blogger. But once you, we might say something on talk radio, and yeah, those 50,000 people or so heard it, but now that it's, some of that's also on your website, well now it's getting quoted by Politico. Now it's getting quoted by some of the blogs that are out there. I think Second Grade Bike Rack quoted the show when we had uh, Steve Running from, uh, from the University of Montana. Well then, because it's out there in the blogosphere, and a lot of these national talk shows and these national producers, again, influencing the influencers, they're out there looking for content for their show, and they're, mon they're monitoring certain blogs that cover certain topics. So I'll guarantee you, because Second Grade Bike Rack probably picked up on that, and then another blog over here picked up on that, well, then Sean Hannity was talking about it on Fox News. And so, so, it, so it, it only extends your influence, and the same can be said that for, uh, for folks in the newspaper and, and for folks in TV as well, that, that now everybody can be a, a multimedia journalist. I mean, I went to Afghanistan last month, and with that little black backpack right there, we did live TV four different times, posted video right to the blog. In fact, sometimes I had to use YouTube to transmit the video because the FTP site was slower. And then we did statewide radio talk show uh, later that night, which is morning here. And then we had blog reports that were being printed in small town newspapers and small town little trade publications. And so now you go from being, you're, you're not just a radio talk show host, you're not just a blogger, you're a blogger who could be doing live TV from Kandahar that's also being carried on a blog and on a newspaper and on t in TV and radio and everywhere else. Uh, let me just follow up if you don't mind. Um, then what, there, there isn't a counterpart to Voice of Montana, on, say on the left, in the radio, would you anticipate, would that be a direction that Montana Cowgirl would go, or would you anticipate there'd be something like that happen? Well, I, I, you know, obviously Air America went, went down, and so the, the left, well, why? I, you know, I don't know why. I think it's just, well, it's like, for example, uh, I, I had a guest show host while I was gone, who's definitely more liberal, you know, former spokesman for a Democratic senator, and and, and which was fun, and it, it was great, and I love mixing it up, and, and I love having guests. We've done the show from the governor's office, and he's great to have on the talk show. He's a great guest to have. But, uh, but you know, one of the feedback was, look, if I wanted to hear that line, I can get it from the newspaper. I get it from the TV. This is where I go to finally get something different. And so I think that's the thing is that, is that talk radio, which really is the original social network, like much like Twitter and everything else, that that's how people were able to talk to each other. That's how Elena in Phillipsburg was able to also share her thoughts with Art and Shepherd or or Ken in Great Falls. Uh, and so, so I I just think it's that because because I mean let's be honest, they they dominate every other uh, media form for the most part. That that the talk radio has been the only thing that that conservatives have had. And plus, you got people that are out there driving tractors and listening to the radio, and and people that are uh, driving you know <laughs> eighteen wheelers and stuff and. So, yeah. Of course, I have to say something. <laughs> um, you know, Aaron. When well, this is Elena in Phillipsburg who listens to the show. For any of you who listen to Voices of Montana, yeah. I sometimes have diarrhea of the mouth. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what you're saying, you know, I'm new to this, and we're in the process of getting a blog up. It's going to be called, and I'll put a plug in, TVF Montana, which is a view from Montana. And I'm from that generation that this is all new, blogs, and I still have a um, land phone. And uh, I go to one room to answer it instead of walking around. Everybody else is doing things. But there's a lot of people in my generation. And I think between the blogs and talk radio, it's a two-way street. And in a state like Montana, 
a big state like this, we have a major part of the population that don't even touch a computer. And they rely on talk radio. So when I say it's a two-way street, it really is. Uh, something happens like in a county, like, and, and I'm learning this. Granite County, I love that phrase. What happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Well, I'm finding out what happens in a county like Granite County or Ravalli County stays there unless you can talk directly to the people or you can hear the, what they're saying on talk radio or now this blog is amazing um, and I'm learning an awful lot and that's how you get the information out regarding I think it's very important to bring up an example the federal mandates act I thought it was amazing that some of our legislators had never even heard of it and even going up to that day I talked to the governor on, on uh, the radio, he at first didn't know what we were talking about either. You did. I did. And a lot of the politicians never heard of this thing. We, in essence, we already have uh, state nullification of federal mandates. And people don't even know about it. But thanks to his show, which I think should be on longer, and I think more people <laughs> should start writing letters. I already did. Um, well, and I'd like to see more, more participation from the left. I mean, there's a lot of them who say, you know, like, I don't know if Rob Cayley from Left in the West is there, but I'm like, hey, come on the show. I mean, we had Jay Stevens on, and they're like, oh, I don't want to go on there. And it's like, you know, look, folks, if you just totally ignore this medium, uh, you know, just like the right, uh, to a certain extent, has, has kind of ignored blogs, uh, not all, of course, but, I mean, you're ignoring your, your future, just like businesses are, uh, in not taking part in that. Yeah. Well, when you say about the left and just like the gentleman did, um, they don't want to hear, they don't talk in facts. It's all fluff with the left, and that's where you get sick of it after a while. Um, I like to listen to them sometimes because I like to and, know what they And there might be some are. folks on the left in here who might want to say, say the same thing the other way. But, but you know, you, you raise an interesting point about, look, there's issues in every county in Montana that people need to hear about across the state. And, and whether it's a blog or talk radio or something, that's a venue that we have to get out. Like, take, take Plentywood, Montana, for example. If you live there, you don't even get Montana TV news. And, and the, the Billings Gazette shows up. It's like the last stop on the trail. And so you got to go down to the little corner gas station at, I think, like 9 o'clock in the morning to get your hands on that. But they get North Dakota news. And so, so radio is, is their link. To, to Montana, to the rest of the state, to hear what's going on in Phillipsburg and Kalispell and Libby and Helen and everywhere else. So and I know we're pushing close to the break and here. And just to say, like, yeah. uh, Granite County, they don't even have a website, really. They have something, but it doesn't give you any information. And so that's what I found, that you don't get many calls from people in Phillipsburg or Granite County. Um, they don't know what's going on. They really don't. But to go back to, I think everybody should write to Voices of Montana, to the station, because I tried to time exactly how many minutes you are on the air. You decide <laughs> six minutes after the hour, and then your commercials, and yeah. then all this other stuff. Got to um, sell soap, as the governor says. Well, we need to do that more, and do make a difference to the station. Thanks, Elena, and great to see you. Uh, Phil, I, I don't know if maybe we should talk more during, because we've got a break. I don't want to push your timeline off, but I know we've still got folks who want to say some have, stuff. How many more people have questions? Two. Okay, great. I really don't have a big question, but I do want to say one thing, Aaron. <laughs> thank you for your service to the country. And oh, thank you for thank that. giving to the people of Montana with the show. I mean, you're doing a great job, well, and we really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. A couple of years ago, um, I asked, what is a blogger? <laughs> um, I, I'm still kind of asking that question. It seems to be a blogger, um, but I'm not sure if I am one, because I still don't know what one is. Yeah. <laughs> but I do understand the importance of communication and networking. And through the radio and, and the internet, it has certainly gone a long ways. And again, I guess that's why my comment. I want to thank you. All right. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you, folks, very much. I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep yet. So thank you very much.